And hello and welcome to Sports Check. I'm Mark Vasco from WKKD. We're talking some high school sports here with Jeff Long of the Beacon News, Stan Goff from the Naperville Sun, and Bob Gordon from the Daily Herald. And also later on in the program, we'll be talking to Dick Kerner, Athletic Director of Wabansi Valley High School. And guys, why don't we start with high school football first. And Jeff, maybe some of the better ball clubs you've seen so far on the Aurora and Naperville area. Well, I've had a chance uh, this season to see all the teams uh, in this area. And without a doubt, Naperville North, uh, the team that's gone to the uh, 6A semifinals the last two years, uh, they have not missed a beat this year. They look as strong as ever. Uh, in the Aurora, Naperville Central is is very strong as well. Uh, after a down year, what are they, 4-1 now? Right. And uh, they're looking awful good. So both Naperville's are uh, looking very strong. In the Aurora area, I'd have to say that the best team is probably uh, Marmion, followed closely by Wabansi Valley. Marmion's 5-0. and all. They've won, I believe, uh, 12 straight regular season games. Their only loss being the, uh, in the playoffs last year. Uh, Wabansi, one more win, and they, uh, they equal their best season ever since the school opened in 75, uh, was it? So uh, the, the, those four, I would say, are probably the best in the area. That and I, that are, seen this so far. could be their first playoff appearance ever for Wabansi Valley. Right. Uh, they've, they've only had one winning season, and that was 5-4 and four a couple of years ago. And if they beat Sycamore this week, uh, they'll equal their best season ever. But I think they'll uh, they will probably set you know their best season ever at the school. They have a fine team out there this year. And Stan, you've watched both Naperville's and for a couple of years now. Is this a better North team? They the last last year's team that lost to East St. Louis in the semifinals. They're up there solid. I think the only <laughs> question mark going in was uh, their defense. They lost a lot of defensive uh, players from last year. Uh, everyone knew their offense was going to be uh, high scoring, and it is of course. But uh, the defense uh, is surprised some people. They, they Plugged in a few guys that didn't play much last year. They're doing the job, and uh, they look pretty solid. But Central uh, surprised me an awful lot. The uh, first two weeks, even though they knocked off uh, ranked teams, uh, they knocked off West Aurora and I think Downers Grove South. I wasn't all that impressed, but uh, watching them week after week, I've seen them all five times, and they, uh, they're starting to look pretty darn good. Yeah, well, Naperville Central was a team that, when they talked about the DuPage Valley before the season started, they talked about Naperville North and both Wheatons. They didn't really even talk about Naperville Central, and now they've got a shot. Yeah, they do. You'd have to say, without a doubt, they're, they've moved themselves up to the top three of the conference. I, I would put Wheaton Central, Naperville North top, one, two right there. They're one and the same. And then Naperville Central is just a notch below. And, and Wheaton Central is going to play Naperville North this weekend, which is we going to be an unbelievable game. That could be the game of the year. Those That's the game of the state, I, I would have to say. You're potentially looking at two state champions. Naperville North has a shot. Their goal, as as person who said throughout is is to go undefeated and win the state comp the state title yeah, and Wheaton North there or Wheaton Central there they well, want to be the next. Wheaton Central is 5A right right and that's the key Naperville North is 6A so theoretically these could be two state champions that'll meet at Wheaton this on, could be uh, the only Friday loss for night. either team throughout the whole in season. In fact uh, the last two years Wheaton Central has beaten Naperville North and that's a team that's gone to the final four twice so uh, they've and got quite a rivalry going there. And this Wheaton mention, Central yeah. team is better than the past two easily. I mentioned that the Marmion team you were talking about out of Aurora, that's a 3A ball club, so mm -hmm. they're kind of a, a smaller school, but they're probably the best small size school in this area, wouldn't you say? I would say so. They have a lot of skilled people in the skill positions, plus they have good size. Uh, they, they didn't lose a thing from last year. A lot of people thought that they would because uh, of the fine season they had last year. I think they were 7-3, and three, made the playoffs, and uh, they, they lost to Geneva, and everyone thought with the graduation of uh, you know Dave Kent's down in Illinois now, and uh, Marty Lorix out at Iowa State, those were two fine ball players, and uh, they lost the nucleus of the team, but obviously they, uh, they haven't lost uh, well, that they, much they talent. Well, they kept Alan Bruckner the they, running they back, reloaded. and I think that had something to do with it, too. <laughs> I think a lot of credit goes to uh, Coach Paul Murphy, too. Uh, he, former assistant at Naperville Central, he's come over to Marmion, and he, he's really turned that program around, and, uh, geez, uh, the last two years they've just been very successful. Now you men mentioned Kent and Lorick that have gone on to... Uh, other big colleges. When I mentioned Dave Garnett, who played linebacker for Naperville North last year, he is at Stanford right mm -hmm. now. And not only as a freshman did he start the week before last, he also made 11 tackles. <laughs> and for a true freshman, not a redshirt freshman, to come in, you know, a, a size program like Stanford and do what he did, you know, and he's, and he's now starting as a freshman. That it'll, says an awful lot. We'll get a lot of uh, publicity this weekend. They're playing against Notre Dame, the number one team in the nation, and that'll national TV exposure. He'll uh, have a chance to show the nation what he can do. He's a, he's a good ball player. His little brother's playing real well this year, too, though. All right, Kevin Garnett is even now on defense for Naperville North. Like Stan was saying, that's one of the keys to why Naperville North is doing so well, because 
McCune is, is willing to play his best players both ways, which he has not done in the past. Yeah, Sean Rendell obviously uh, joins Garnett in the backfield and joins him in going both ways. And, uh, <coughs> as long as we're looking at the DuPage Valley Conference, you know, why don't we take a look at the standings right now? I know that uh, both Wheatons are atop the con or nope. Wheaton Central and Naperville North right. are atop the conference in in that way at three and zero. So not only <coughs> will they be playing, you know, for maybe the uh, the glory of which team you know could be the state champion, but they're also right, basically playing for the conference championship this weekend. Right. There shouldn't be anyone other than those two teams that would have a chance. Wheaton North is looking tough this year, but I don't think they're as good as they've been in the past. I don't think they're... Naperville Central dropped a tough game to Wheaton Central. Obviously, they have North yet, so maybe they're pulling for... <laughs> they're pulling to see uh, uh, Central get bumped off by North and hope to... Uh <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be unreasonable like last year when they had the three-way tie for the conference with everybody at, at, with one loss. You know, you know, what's interesting about this matchup this week is that the teams are so even. I, I was looking at some stuff this morning. They're both averaging 35, 36 points a game. They're both giving up uh, eight or nine points a game. When you look at the common opponents, uh, Glenbard North and West Chicago, they beat them almost exactly <laughs> by the, the same amount of Quite points. Easily. You know, <laughs> one or two points off. And the funny thing is, those two teams are a lot alike as well. They both have strong quarterbacks with, with Thorne and the first snow. They can throw the ball, they can run the option, they can play real well. They both have the great running backs. They both have a lot of two-way players that are, that are starring on both sides of the ball. They both have a strong defense. That's the type of game that you want to go to and just toss the clipboard aside, <laughs> and you throw the <laughs> microphone away, and just kick back and be a fan. Yeah, that's that's, that's uh, definitely not one that that's you want to work at. You just want to be there to enjoy. And coming into this season, as far as the DuPage Valley was concerned, they all talked about Kinney as the quarterback from Wheaton North and Thorne from Wheaton Central. They didn't mention too much about first and all from Naperville North, and he may be the best of the three, or at least having the better season of the three. Statistically, he might be having the better season. I don't think there is a better athlete playing quarterback than Jeff Thorne. I think Jeff Thorne is, if, if he had two more inches on him or 20 more pounds, he'd, he'd be Division One. They'd be all after him. I still see him as a Division One quarterback. I don't know. It takes somebody that would be willing to take a risk. Well, and there's, there's different levels of Division One anyway, yeah, really. Five foot ten, you know. He could go and, and play and, and, and start for a team, but like you say, it's, it might be a lower Division One, or it'd have to be a coach that's willing to take a risk. The thing about first, I know he got like, some of that experience at the end of last year when uh, Craig Isle was hurt. First, was able to win a couple of games, win a couple of playoff games. But I, the key to then was uh, North DC He wasn't scoring an awful lot of points. He was getting the victory. But this year, he's putting the points on the board as well. Well, and it helps the fact that they they set up the running game almost every game anyway, with first and Owen Garnett, and and then that obviously helps the passing game. Eventually, when the, they watch Kevin Garnett ramble 30 yards or so, <laughs> and all of a sudden they have to pay attention to him, and they can throw to the wideouts. Yeah. And it's nice to have the kind of offensive line North has. Right. Uh, we were talking off the air earlier about great players, great running backs who, uh, say, had a good year last year, but then their line graduates, and, and this year they're nowhere to be found among the rushing leaders. So that tells you how much uh, an offensive line means to, to the skill players, it's like their success. No doubt. As far as the Little Seven Conference is concerned, Wabonsi Valley just this, this past weekend took on Geneva on their homecoming and uh, had a very good day as it <laughs> turned out and a great offensive day uh, on the ground in particular. Of course, they've had Hugh Williams, who's done well anyway. Why don't we take a look at the Little Seven Conference standings as we, as we speak. I know Oswego, after losing a non-conference game to Marmion, I think that shook them up. I think they yeah. thought that they were going to have uh, maybe an easy time in that conference, and, or uh, at least you know, challenge. All of a sudden, maybe that loss to Marmion woke them up because they've been doing real well ever since. Yeah, and I think uh, seeing that game and then seeing what Oswego has done since then tells you how good Marmion is because uh, Marmion came back from a 13 nothing deficit, I believe, and won that game 27-13. to Oswego has since won four straight. Of course, Wabonsi Valley, one of the reasons they've been doing so well is Hugh Williams, and here's a, a long run from Hugh from this past Friday night's game at home, in the homecoming game against the Geneva Vikings, but that was a 38-yard touchdown drive in the fourth quarter, and he's been doing that all year long. He had almost 200 yards in that game, and he now has close to 700 yards in just five <laughs> football games so this year. He's got to be one of the better running backs in the area, and uh, this is one of the reasons why. I mean, he's got the size, but he can also get in the defensive backfield in a hurry. Yeah, he saw how quickly he broke to that hole. That was a nice opening on the offensive line, but he got there quick. He runs a lot of guys over. <laughs> Big and not too slow. No question about it. In the very next play, uh, Hugh Williams got the call again and eventually went into the end zone. I think that was the, uh, the capping score in that game against the Geneva Vikings, and there's some power. <laughs> you saw speed in one carry. The very next carry, you saw some power as he carried a couple into the end zone. 
and uh, that's Hugh Williams. What about some of the other running backs that we've seen? You know, we talked about Drendel and Garnett. Are there others that we haven't talked about yet? Uh, well, one of the best rushers I've seen is over West Aurora, and he's a quarterback, Rich Becker. Uh, he's the fastest guy on the team, and in fact, he's been among our Beacon News area leader, leading rushers all year long. Um, Dan Dixon out of Oswego, I've seen him. He gained, I believe, 75 yards the first two weeks, and the last, uh, the last four weeks, I believe, he's up around 500 yards. He had the Five, one big day. Yards. Yeah, 200 well, yards. Well, one loss. Monty. He had a big yeah. day. Of course, for Becker, they're not afraid to use him about every <laughs> minute of, of every game. <laughs> That's true. Like, he runs back kick kicks, and, and then he's the quarterback. He plays on defense, and right. he's out there all the time. But... When you've got a big play player, you may as well go with him. That's uh, that's the philosophy over there. Is he's an impact player, and they want to get him in the game as much as possible. The Wheatons are winning ball games, and obviously it's just not the quarterbacks. What about their runners? Right, you've got uh, Shutters and and Scott playing for Wheaton Central, and they're both having real good seasons. They're getting with Thorne and the option to pass. They're they're getting big holes <laughs> when they're running, and people aren't expecting to see them. And uh, I was thinking of one player. It's a little bit out of the area, but a guy named Mike Junta from Glenbard West, who. Uh, any of these schools might see in the playoffs, the 5A schools. He uh, he's scoring 20, 21 points a game for Glenbard West. <laughs> so averaging basketball close numbers to, there. <laughs> averaging close to 200 yards a game, and he's probably the best running back I've seen this year. Of course, Neighborville Central's got a great pair of running it's backs, Clint Jensen and Sean Kovalt, and they almost complement each other, even though they're not really both fullback or tailback types, but. They both have great speed, and they get back in the back in the defensive backfield in a hurry. Yeah, Coach Bungie likes to use uh, he likes to send Cobalt up the middle a lot, and he's in, give him a little bit of a hole, and he'll get through there. He's pretty quick, and then he likes to get Jensen outside. Although I'll use Jensen up the middle as well, but Clint Jensen's awfully fast. Uh, he showed it on the baseball field, uh, <laughs> leading the team to the summer league title, uh, playing center field, and uh, he's awfully quick. And Sean Cobalt, only a junior, has uh, been getting about 100 yards a game for them. And yeah, well, I said it last spring. I said the two best center fielders I saw in the state were Clint Jensen from Naperville Central and maybe Chuck Meredith from Aurora Central. And the best thing about Clint was, at the time, he was only a junior. <laughs> so, you know, Chuck was a senior, and he's now gone to COD, and uh, Clint's going to be around for a whole other year yet. And he goes and gets it, and also, obviously, out of the backfield. So those are, uh, those are pretty good rushers, there's no question yeah. about it. Well, the, they use his arm, too. Jensen's got such a great arm that a lot of times uh, the, the, they'll, they'll run the option, and, and, and Jensen will throw a pass. They've done that on more than... Uh, several occasions. You know, this Naperville Central team reminds me of the one a couple years ago. Uh, was it 86 when they went to the quarterfinals? Remember that? And their offense uh, had no, no semblance of a passing game. <laughs> they had the two good rushers like they have now. Uh, who were they? States and uh, who right. was the other guy? Marinkoff. Yeah, right. right. Uh, and they were 9-3 and three that year. And this year they have very little uh, passing, but they have a real strong rushing game, good defense. So maybe it's a uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a carbon copy of that 1986 team. Yeah, yeah I talked to Joe Bungie on our, uh, on our radio talk show the other day, and I was talking about the, the passing game. And I saw in the week before last, he threw, I think it was nine or ten times, and we laughed about that. That was the that season's was high, high so far. I mean, normally it's four or five, but they don't need to if both running backs end yeah. up with, uh, with, you know, two or three hundred yards total combined. Yeah, Mike Stock showed, though, uh, at the end of the Wheaton Central game. He, uh, he had to go to the air. They were down. They needed a touchdown, and he drove them, uh, you know, completed three, four passes in, in, in that awfully windy day. But... Uh, you know, it's not that he's not a good quarterback. It's just that when you got Koval and Jensen to hand the ball to you, might as well stick with that. What about that day? Was that <laughs> two weeks ago Friday? Was that the windiest football Friday night you've ever seen? I know <laughs> I've never seen a 50-mile-an-hour wind at a football game. And they were out of the north, too. They were just cold, biting winds, and that, that's got to be rough to play in. Yeah. It was like you expected a 60-yard punt with the wind, and you expected an 8- or 9-yard punt <laughs> against it, and that's what you got. They, they had, uh, we were looking at our stats the next day, and there were two or three runners right at 200 yards from that, just from the high schools that we were covering that night just because nobody's putting the ball up. Yeah, nobody put it up, that's right. I, I looked at the stats the following Saturday morning, too, and the, the passing the, the passing was terrible, uh, <laughs> no, matter, no matter what box score you looked in or what summer you looked in. Well, even if you were with passing. the wind. I mean, yeah. you were still going to float the ball oh, and yeah. you weren't going to complete it regardless. I've never seen a flagpole almost fall. That, that, <laughs> that's what I knew. It's just a little too windy out there. Well, I know that uh, Obermeyer's got a great leg for Naperville North. He tried a 22-yard field goal into the wind. Okay, but you're only 22 yards away. You think <laughs> even the wind can't affect that. And he gets his kicks real high. The wind stopped the kick before it got to the uprights <laughs> and blew it back. And I heard there was a story, another game similar to that, where the ball not only blew back, it hit like a defensive lineman in the back <laughs> or something. It was just <laughs> you're talking about kickers. Obermeyer is probably one of the better ones in the area. I've seen Duvick from Bennett, from the uh, famed Duvick kicking family <laughs> right. of Bennett. And... Uh, 
he's as good as his brothers. He had a tough game against Naperville North, but uh, he's having a good season this but year. He has but over a 52 or 53 yarder this year for Bennett. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, even 10, 12 years ago, that if you had a 30 yard field goal <laughs> in, in a high school, school game, you were thanking your lucky stars. And it wasn't that long ago you wouldn't even try one. Even you know, even at the half, you'd throw up a desperation pass before you'd have it. A lot of teams would even always consistently go for the two-pointer because they didn't have a guy who could kick the extra point. And but a lot of that has come, I think, from this. This is the age of specialization now. Not even that, <laughs> from so. soccer. You know, the kids sure. are playing soccer yeah, when they're right. young, and then they decide, no, I don't want to play soccer in high school. I'll go out for the team, the football team. It's a lot, a lot more glory, a lot more fun. You get people like us sitting around. <laughs> <talking about you. laughs> I think that's a big reason also why you don't see uh, too many straightaway kickers anymore. Oh, yeah. Just because of the soccer boom that's going on. Uh, speaking of soccer-style kickers, the, the kid at Naperville Central. Yeah, uh, Cunningham. 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 He, uh, Bungie's got an awful lot of faith in him. He says he can go to him every time they're, they get a 50-yarder. <laughs> we saw him. Where, was it a uh, West Aurora? West Aurora game. <laughs> West Aurora game. He attempts uh, was a 52-yard field goal. Missed it, but the, the kick had enough distance to go 60, 65 yards. <laughs> just wide. At least 60. Yeah, it was just <laughs> wide left. But it was funny because we were up in the press box at the time. And when they lined up for the 52-yarder, I mean, I could hear everybody in the press box going, Oh, sure, come on. What's this coach doing? doing? <laughs> he just crushed it. That was the same game, it was the first time I'd ever seen it happen, a field goal attempt, you know, a free kick field goal attempt after a fair catch yeah. of a punt. When, that, that, that's a rare, yeah, right Tim then. Cedarblad said he uh, had been looking forward to using that and uh, <laughs> almost came through for him. Yeah, I did a little piece on that after the game and uh, inter interviewed or t you know, talked to an official who had been around 16 years. Uh, he said he had never seen that in his, uh, in his years of officiating. That's a real rare, but he says it's been in the books. Uh, ever since they they uh, wrote the rules, so it's just a, it's just a little used. And uh, and Reggie Walls, who had that kick, there was a fair catch at the 35-yard line, which means that it's going to be a 45-yard field goal attempt because you don't move it back seven. It's just a free kick. And set he, it down on the tee and uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he had the distance, not by a lot, but it would have made it. But he was just wide to the left. That was in the same game. You saw a 52-yard field goal attempt and a 45-yard uh, free-kick field goal attempt. I believe. And uh, Wabansi Valley had an interesting homecoming on Friday night against Geneva, did they not? Yes, we did. And you yes, had a big turnout. We, uh, I tell you why we're so excited, because we just got our new stands. And everybody says, I don't see how we can fill all those. But we filled them the other night. We probably had between three and 4,000 mm -hmm. people. So it was a very exciting night for us and something very new to us. So <laughs> it was very special. When was the first graduating class? Seventy, seventy-five was our first class, and that was up to junior class. And they gra so the first graduating class was seventy-six. And what size were you guys when when you started? How many students were the first? Well, I started. I was hired first in the district by our principal, and that was nineteen seventy-four. And at that time, we were two hundred and eighty kids. Our <laughs> first, our first class. Or I mean, a combination of all right. our classes. And so we've come a long yeah, ways. A we were just talking yeah, about right. what now. We're around between 15 and 1600, and uh, it's you never know how much you're going to increase each year the way our district is growing out there. It's well, the entire area, Naperville right. and the entire area. So it's scary how fast it's growing. I mean, you can yeah. see the development well, moving every day. It's very difficult to plan ahead. I mean, because it's there's no stability. It it goes up every year. Your programs increase. Your levels increase. You hire new teachers every year, and the, the housing is not slowing down at all just keeps coming. You just had a big addition to the school and there's going to be more? We just added classrooms and locker rooms to our uh, swimming pool area and also uh, we they don't want us to call it a field house but I can <laughs> I like to call it a field house. Okay. New locker rooms and uh, weight room and gymnastic area and uh, so it's, it's kind of exciting and this is there's still another phase to go which will be in the front of the building which will be in an auditorium music area classroom so we will be fit for close to 3,000 students by the time we're finished. And which that's, which that's means you're outgrowing the Little Seven Conference. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'll be the, the next subject. To the Little Six and a big one yeah. Or, yeah. or a new conference? Well, we have, including this year, we have two more years to go in the Little Seven. They've told you and that they want you out. Right. Them. And this was discussed over a two year period. It was, uh, the procedure was class act, and we knew that. You know, by this time we had to look for another conference, and it's only logical as fast as we're growing. So there wasn't the animosity that happened in the West Suburban or West Suburban Catholic when. when no, I don't think so. I, you know, it's it's one of those situations where we were growing like 200 students a year. 
we had a period of time there where we didn't grow for about five, six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. We were just stalemate, and so there was no prominent conference. And of course, we were not winning then either in all our <laughs> the levels. The football team has grown a lot right, at the school, right. obviously. And what has happened now is that we have picked up, in the last probably five, six, seven years, we're picking up 200 students a year in the high school. So we're naturally growing, we're competing, we're getting better. But I don't think that's the point. I, the point is that when you get to a point where you're twice the size of other schools in this type of situation, uh, you increase in your levels and everything else. Therefore, it's not a comfortable situation to be in a little seven. We will enjoy being in it for a couple more years to enjoy what we're going through right now. Well, and you took your licks for a while, and now oh, yeah. you're going <laughs> to yeah. start to maybe get for a, a couple of time. trophies to show for it. And that's what I tell many of the younger coaches. Uh, and unless they've been through that situation, they don't really appreciate what's going on right now. So I would think you'd have a deep appreciation, like you're saying you were there yes, before the school I, even was. Yes, I was coaching, uh, I'm still coaching lower level, but I was coaching uh, with Matt Lork. Uh, I was an assistant varsity coach for, uh, ever since day one. <laughs> Like with we Mr. Lark, and we went through so many tough times, and we w won a football game. It was very exciting, <laughs> and we very much appreciated it. And so this is very exciting to myself. Many people have been there for 15 years, and we still have many of our, you know, coaches that started with us years ago. So we hope like we're Like we said at the beginning of the year, you've only had one winning season with, with the football team, so it's got to be nice to be formed that right was, now. That was well. uh, Coach Lorick's last year. We were 5-4. and four. It was a very exciting year. And now you're potentially, you're, you're looking at a, a real good shot making the playoffs. 7-2 and two is not out of the question. Yes. Uh, Coach Luke and uh, myself, we were talking about, I think when you're in this game of coaching, you learn to experience each week <laughs> and just take each week at a time. And, of course, the kids, are all, yeah, the kids <laughs> are all excited, and the sports writers are excited, and, uh, the publicity, everybody's excited, so especially the parents. But I think you really learn to take this, you know, uh, just gradual and build up to each week. Because I had a good experience years ago when I was coaching the Upstate 8 that every time you played a football team each week, it was a, it was a football game. Everybody was so competitive and mm -hmm. all had good football programs. And that's the same in the DuPage County. Uh, I think sometimes uh, there's a tendency to not realize that about the Little Seven. The Little Seven is a very good athletic conference, and it's very competitive. And uh, I'll tell you one thing, uh, we'll go out to Sycamore this weekend, and uh, we'll have our hands full. We will have to play good football is to this, beat Sycamore. Is this scenario totally out of line? Here's my, here's my theory on the mm -hmm. conference shakeup. Have Even though the Cow was in first place right now in football, mm -hmm. they still... They're the, a smaller school in the upstate eight. Have DeKalb and even West Chicago, even though they're close to your same size, come to the little seven, have Oswego go to the upstate eight, and you come to the DuPage Valley. Does that make any sense? I have heard so many, there's so many solutions to this. Uh, there's many things that go on are, are naturally rumors, and you get bits from everybody, you know, but... Uh, Right now, I would say that uh, there, there's comments that DeKalb is the smallest school in the upstate eight. But then again, you have to look at DeKalb and look at them and how they look at the situation that they have much pride in being in the upstate eight. It's a great conference, very competitive conference. Some, some of your top people in the state every year. And so they're thinking about this. Uh, I think that uh, we're in a situation where we know we have to move on mm -hmm. because of our size and because of not just that, because of increasing coaching numbers of coaches and levels. We get more kids, we want more levels. And then uh, West Chicago, you have to realize that, number one, a transportation thing, it's fantastic, that league. And uh, it's, it's just, uh, I would say, uh, well, it's exciting to talk about. It's exciting to talk about, but West Chicago could not move over to the Little Seven right now because of the... They're too big. Yeah. You're talking about travel. I just did a column this past Friday on Fenton, and, and their, their travel from there in, in the Bourbon, for instance, they're in the eastern part of DuPage County, going all the way up to the Wisconsin border to play. Whereas in the DuPage Valley, you're looking at Naperville Central as the longest road trips, and that's 10 miles to Glenbard East mm -hmm. or to Glenbard North. Mm -hmm. you know, as, in terms of, of perfect location, the DuPage Valley is, is about as good as any conference gets in the state. Well, I have a feeling that Wabansi well, Valley, either way, will, uh, <laughs> will remain on their feet. And now that they've uh, got some winning seasons, it's got to feel pretty good. Dick, well, thank you for stopping okay. by. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for it right now, I'm afraid. <laughs>
made it. I'm like, it's a real shame. So that's. I think we'll uh, have to bench him for this one. <laughs> I think maybe, and I think the you know, Kangaroo Court's going to have to find Joe. Oh, yes. Long. We have to figure out yes, what it's going to be. We can't quite figure out what it's going to be. We can't quite figure out what it's going to be. Well, welcome once again to Sports Check. And once again, we'll be talking for about the next half hour or so about high school sports in the Fox Valley area. I'm Mark Vasco from WKKD. And along for the ride this time around, Bob Gordon from the Daily Herald and Stan Goff from the Naperville Sun. In the second half of our show, we'll be talking to Ross Trump, our athletic director of Naperville Central. And guys, I don't think there's any question about uh, maybe one of the, uh, the bigger games this past weekend, mm -hmm. football-wise anyway. That was the game that uh, both Bob and I were uh, fortunate enough to see because that was one of the better high school games you'll see in a long, long time. Naperville North knocking off Wheaton Central 20-14. to 14. That was a great game. It, it really was. As we were talking beforehand, the only game I think I've seen that I've covered that was more exciting was last year's 5A state championship between Peoria Richwoods and Belvedere, which was 29-26 and won in the last second. And this game was won with 50 seconds left when when Korosek scored his final touch on his second touchdown of the game, which was only right because so Korosek was the one guy that won <laughs> and accepted the pass that set up the whole thing. What a game he had. This kid's a junior. You know, he's playing in the backfield with Sean Drendel and, and Kevin Garnett, two of the best running backs in the area. And he was he was the workhorse Friday night on, in, the, in the backfield. Which was kind of surprising because going into that game, the workhorses were Drendel and Garnett. Right. And even though he was the other man in that backfield all year long and we got a few carries, he was not the main emphasis. And I think maybe one of Wheaton's strategies was uh, you know, to stop those two. That's why they went to Karosik, and it certainly worked. I definitely agree. I was talking to Coach McCune after the game, and I was asking him, you know, why was Drendel out of the game plan? He had one carry for 12 yards, and Coach McCune said there were a number of times that he had the call. The call was for Drendel, and at the line, first snow saw what was going on, what the Wheaton Central defense was giving him, and he called it away. And a lot of, as you saw, as you called and during the game, there were half the times Corsett carried the ball as a counter play. He scored his winning touchdown on a counter play. So Wheaton Central was overloading towards Strendel and, and Garnett, and that left that counter wide open. And Corsett had some nice gains. He ended up with over 40 yards on the ground, which surprisingly led the Naperville <laughs> North ground. Yeah, really. they, had, they had very few yards. I got some stats sitting around here. They ended up with something like 72 yards rushing on the night. And it was the battle of the undefeated teams in the DuPage Valley Conference, and Naperville North got the W, so they're now all alone by themselves. But uh, as we said last week on this show, probably two teams that will be at least in the semifinals of their state tournaments in 5A and 6A. You'd like to think that. And you look at the 5A, Wheaton Central probably has a tougher road to a state championship because they've got the 6A state champion, Mount Carmel, dropping down a class. They're under, they were undefeated going into last weekend. You got Belvedere's back in there. Richwoods is back in there. There's some really tough 5A teams. Naperville Central, uh, Naperville North seems to have maybe a little bit, not as much competition. They could be the, the class of 6A after watching them play this week. And Wheaton Central played well against them, and they had a chance to win. But the fact that Naperville North was willing to stay in there, and we were talking about Corsex interception, Wheaton Central is marching down the field to score the winning touchdown. They were down to the 25-yard line with just you know play after play after play. They were getting gaining yards. They were getting ready to go in there, and all of a sudden the pass is tossed up there, and Korosek jumped as high as he can jump. The way uh, Coach McCune said, he jumped out of the gym. I think he was uh, <laughs> mixing his, his metaphors season metaphors there, yeah. there but uh, <laughs> but Korosek got up there, and then he ran 47 yards down the sideline. They got the ball down to the Wheaton Central 30, 37, 38, something like that. And a big, big pass. We talked about Sean Drendel, how he shut out of the running game, but uh, the first no found Drendel wide open in the middle. Got him down to the five-yard line, 36-yard pass play, and that's what set up Korosek. Well, on Wheaton Central, I said this during the game, I can't remember the last time any team had 20-some first downs on Naperville North's defense. Right. Then. And with all those first downs, they still weren't getting in the end zone because eventually, you know, they would either turn the ball over or North would stop them. That's pretty much Naperville North was saying. Uh, McKean was saying that at halftime, well, they trailed by a point at the half, and uh, six, right? they were quite, they were kind of content to be down by just one after uh, Wheaton Central did quite a bit in the first half. You'd uh, have to be Wheaton Central had the ball for 18 minutes in the first half. They had three just unbelievably sustained drives, <laughs> and all they got out of that was one touchdown. Seven points. And that 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 you wonder what Wheaton Central is going to go through this week if there's going to be a letdown, because they, they played their hearts out and came away with a loss. On their home field in front of a huge crowd, <laughs> just huge. You were Wheaton Central's homecoming. Was it the same type of crowd? It was just as It was actually probably bigger because there were more people on the opposite side, the Naperville North side. There, you know, you were three, four deep there. 
it was as many people on the Wheaton Central side as there were for homecoming, and then you had the extra people from the Naperville North, which is a great sign to me that prep sports had yeah. that much backing in this area. This is a great, great football area. You got some, you got four teams in the DVC alone that are going to make the playoffs and could do a lot in the state playoffs. And it brings Naperville Central into play uh, with that uh, victory for Naperville North, and with C Wheaton Central's loss, Naperville Central now uh, having Wheaton North and Naperville North down the stretch can uh, conceivably go for the. Uh, conference title if they can win those couple of tough games at the end. Well, yeah. news and stand off from the Naperville Sun. Guys, welcome to the show once again. And it's it's getting close to playoff time. And we've got a couple ball ball teams that uh, have already clinched with 7-0 uh, and o records, some teams with six wins that uh, are going to be on the bubble. I think that's one of the things we ought to talk about is uh, some of those yeah. six-win teams. Real quick, why don't we talk about what it is that determines who makes the playoffs. Five years ago now, the IHSA, IHSA decided to expand the playoffs and with that expansion, instead of needing seven wins to get into the playoffs, a six and three team could make it. So now the way the rules, the way it works out is any seven and two, eight and one, or nine and zero oh team makes the playoffs guaranteed. And over the past four years, 67 percent of the six and three teams have made it in. And and the six and three determining thing is is a that, fun lo that lovely point total we talk <laughs> about, that nebulous point total. What does that mean? It's the only reason why we took math, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, I just wait for somebody else to talk yes. about it. Like you guys, you compile in the paper. I take it from you guys and mention it the next day on the air. So It's a matter of points that the other teams, that, that these teams play, their, the total of their victories add up to the points. I know Jeff was just doing it for the local teams for today's paper. And what, what were you, 36 usually is a cutoff point. Right. I, I was looking at something that I brought along, and in the last four years, uh, 36 has been the cutoff for three of the years, and 35 was uh, one of the other years, 1987. And the only reason that was lower was because the Chicago Public Schools were on strike that year, right. so they needed more teams from the public league into mm -hmm. the playoffs. So the, the teams we're looking at around here, uh, obviously Naperville North has, has clinched. They're 7-0, though. They will, will likely go as a conference champion, which is more... Uh, which is preferable to an at-large berth because usually uh, those teams have a better chance of hosting. It's not a hard, fast rule, but the IHSA does its best to uh, to give conference champions a home game. Uh, you, your chances are better, put it that way. Um, the other area team, which has already clinched, is Marmion, which is also 7-0. They play Driscoll this weekend, and that will likely decide the conference championship because both are 7-0. and That should be a pretty good game. Driscoll, too, then obviously is qualified. They, they for right. the 2A and Marmion for the 3A. It'll be for the first and suburban Catholic conference title. Well, that's a good point, too, though. I mean, you're talking about the same conference, but once you talk about the playoffs, you divide them differently right. than conference. <laughs> I mean, you're going 3A and 2A and whatever else, and those two teams, same conference, but different playoff avenues, just like Wheaton Central and Naperville North, North as far as DuPage Valley. Correct, right. In the DuPage Valley, you've got four teams that have all, they all have six wins now, and they're all guaranteed of making the playoffs because the minimum amount of points any of them will have is 39. So the victories this past weekend made four teams from the DVC into the playoffs, including Naperville Central, which we were talking about before we were on the air. Stand up on yeah, they're one of the six and one teams. One of the surprise six and one teams, I yeah. would say. But because of their competition and uh, obviously they lost to Wheaton Central, but uh, the teams they've beaten and because of their schedule, they'll be one of the. If they were to lose the last two games, like you said, they'd be six and three and would still get a get a bit into the playoffs. And what you've been, you you saw them play on Friday night when they beat West Chicago 18 nothing, but they're a little banged up. Yeah, they are. Uh, they lost their fullback two weeks ago, Sean Cobalt, and uh, fortunately for them, that's one of the positions where they're kind of deep. They uh, they've got quite a few running backs who like to run off the ball. Omar Weathersby, uh, you know, he tends to pick up 50, 60 yards every week in the fourth quarter alone. And he doesn't play <laughs> until then because they don't need him. But uh, they got lost a couple of linebackers, Matt Gans and uh, Matt Armstrong got banged up. They're questionable and. Uh, Obviously, they got a tough home stretch with Wheaton North and Naperville North the last two weeks. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Cobalt's gone for the year, right? Yeah, Cobalt it will not be back, but uh, the two mats, uh, they're still questionable for this week. Of course, Naperville North, they got a win on Friday night in their homecoming, 49-14. to, uh, to 14. We've got some videotape coming up of that football game, as that was out there on Friday for that game against Lombard South, and they've been known as a big play team all year long. Naperville and they North, had... not Lombard South. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to clarify. No, no, no. Okay. We know that. Yeah. Uh, Glenbard South to get their one, though. Remember, we talked about that last week. Well, that's right. Okay. And uh, Naperville North ha has been outplayed as far as time of possession in every game this year, except for this past one, Friday night, where they're undefeated because <laughs> they keep having big plays. Like uh, this play, for instance, was a 65 yard touchdown pass as Todd Personal looks for uh, Bill Karosik and finds him down the right sideline, streaking in the end zone for a TD. And this was just underway 
less than a couple minutes into this football game. Thankfully, it didn't go out of bounds. I think it would have run over that cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was a great picture. And then, of course, later on that same first quarter, uh, Sean Drendel has had such a great year uh, offensively and defensively. Comes from a wing spot, takes a carry, and goes in. So they had an early 14 nothing lead in this contest as uh, you see him break outside, go down the right sideline. Sean Drendel, who is a Division One prospect certainly, but mainly on defense from what I hear, but on offense you can tell he uses that speed to his advantage. And he went into the end zone. That's another big play for them. And he's not the only running back they have mm -hmm. because we know Kevin Garnett, the mm -hmm. fullback, mm -hmm. is, a, uh, is, a, is a great runner. Now, this was also in that same first quarter, come to think of it, as there was a, a handoff up the middle, and Garnett shows his speed and just goes streaking untouched in the defensive secondary. And Garnett with a big play. I think we're going to see this play again, too, just to show you his explosive speed once he gets in the backfield. And they've got some key ball players for a big school going both ways. That, and we were talking about that earlier in the year. This is one of the first years that Coach McCune's used it is the first year that he's used more than one player going both ways, and he's got uh, he's got the the three backfield guys, Korsak, Drendel, and Garnett all playing both ways, and they're all playing great. <laughs> Korsak had that big interception that won the game last week against a week ago against Wheaton Central. And the very next play after this Garnett run, it was uh, Korsak again, and he goes into the end zone one more time, and right off the bat, first quarter score, you know, 21 nothing, Naperville North. They go on for an easy. 49 to 14 win over Glenbard Makes South for a nice homecoming. homecoming, yeah. <laughs> the dance was a lot more fun, I'm sure, after that. And it was interesting because Coach McEwen during the week was a little concerned. He thought, you know, you're coming off an emotional win against Wheaton Central. There's a, t you know, possible letdown there. And then you've got a homecoming, and there's a lot of distractions going on with the dance and everything else. And he was really concerned this week, but it uh, <laughs> didn't look like they were affected too no, much. No. And they should have a they should have an easy week this week as well, and, and Wheaton Central should both have an easy game. But then you've got the, the Naperville Central Wheaton North game Friday night, which should be the big area game this week, and especially in the DVC. And, and then Naperville North, Naperville Central, the last one. And Wheaton North, North Wheaton Central. Okay. So yeah. you've got you've got Always the four games. the two crosstown games. Yeah, when we take a look at the standings, as long as we're talking about these matchups coming up in the DuPage Valley right now, Naperville North by virtue of that win goes seven and zero. Oh but also 5-0, and of course, in conference to give them first place. Three teams chasing them, but by the point totals, we're all saying all four teams are going to get in the playoffs anyway. Correct. And Glenbar North, with their loss over the weekend, that knocked them out of playoff contention. They were 3-3 three and three with a hope of going 6-3 and three and making the playoffs, but now the best they'll do is 5-4. and four. So it's, it'll be the top four teams you see right there will all make the playoffs. Two of them in, in 5A, the two Wheatons, and two of them in 6A, the two Naperville's. And, and the thing about Naperville North, it just... It seems to me that they remind me of the Oakland A's. Uh, you know, if, okay. I can, if I can use comparisons, <laughs> this is a seasonal comparison. Uh, Naperville North's been in the semifinals the last two years. Uh, it, so, so the novelty of making the playoffs is worn off. I, I think that they want to get there, and they're on a mission. I, I, I just, it, it just seems to me like that. The A's were in the series last year. Uh, the Giants weren't. They're happy to be there. The A's... Are, uh, taking care I of guess my studies. question would be, who drives the fastest and gets to be Jose Canseco? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. we'll get to that later. <laughs> well, they need a lot more arrogance to be like the A's. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We just looked at the Little Seven Conference there, and we know Wabansi Valley has has a shot to get in the playoffs. We know Morris is in because of uh, their seven and zero at this point. Oswego uh, still has a shot for conference titles since they've got Morris coming up this weekend. But I think point totals wise, Oswego should get in too. I think Oswego is, is as good as in right now. They have uh, 31 points. And with two weeks to go, so I, like we said earlier, 36 has been the cutoff in three of the last four years. Uh, well, well Bonsi Valley, uh, they play Plainfield this week. That's a must-win for them, having to go to Morris the following week, which would be a very tough game for them. Uh, if Wabansi wins this week, they'll set a school record for wins. They've already assured themselves of their second winning season in the school's 13-year history. Uh, they never made the playoffs, and that's a big goal for them. So they, they have their work cut out, but be a nice reward for them to make the playoffs. And obviously for Plainfield, it's do or die in the same situation. Well, Plainfield was hurt by the, the teacher strike they had on there. They lost the game to that, and if it, if it wasn't for the teacher strike, they probably would have beat Caneland, I believe it was the, the game they lost. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, it's just the unfortunate things of strikes. You've, you've seen what strikes have done to the Upstate 8 this year, just torn it apart. We were talking about the Upstate 8. They'll only, it looks like there'll only be one team that makes the playoffs because of the strikes. Although Streamwood still has an outside chance, DeKalb is guaranteed being in 7-0. Yeah, let's take a look at the Upstate 8 as we're talking about it. As you mentioned, DeKalb with a win over West Aurora. Uh, 
No, right now you saw that game, Jeff. DeKalb is sold. DeKalb is it. They've got good skill plus, uh, a nice defense, and they turned the ball over, I think, four or five times against West last week, but uh, th that's part of the game, and they were able to overcome that and, you know, still beat West. Just keep I, I things think exciting, I would think, right? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> no, we're going to win. Let's give you the ball for a while. And Streamwood has losses at this point, so they've got a shot. They will make the playoffs as a 6-3 and three team if they yeah, win their last two that. games. And then do we have the Suburban Catholic Conference? And we know from the Suburban Catholic Conference that uh, Marmion is in the playoffs by virtue of, of their win last week. So they go to 3-0 and in conference, but more importantly, 7-0 and overall, 7-0 and overall also for Driscoll. Right. Both of those teams are in right now. And the one at the bottom, the former member of the West Suburban Catholic, you see Bennett there, 4-3. and three. They are definite in at 6-3, and three, but they're not yeah. a definite 6-3. and three. They have, they <laughs> Providence first. They've they got Providence, Providence this, this week. Night, yeah. Providence is one of the top teams in the state. They're, they're yeah, right up there. That was a costly loss for them this week with uh, Bolingbrook. Uh, right, that was one that they had to win, especially after losing to Belvedere the week before. You know, playing the tough competition they're playing, that's why they're guaranteed in at 6-3. and three. But We've talked about the rankings before and the fact that right now Naperville North is, what, three in the state, Naperville Central nine in the state before this week's rankings have actually come out. Tell me about undefeated teams Marmion and Driscoll. <laughs> Marmion, <laughs> undefeated, not listed in 3A, Driscoll, undefeated, still not listed in 2A. And Driscoll knocked off, at the time, the number one team in 3A about four weeks back, their beginning <laughs> part of the season. They knocked off a team from Springfield that had not lost, and, and nobody recognized <laughs> them. What can you say? Well, that's why I don't put a lot of stock in, in, the, you know, in the rankings. I think it's a, a rank rating system, if you can put it that way. Uh, you can, we can. <laughs> Marmion is one of the most underrated teams around because they've won, what, 14, 14 out of the last 15 games, 14 straight regular season games, and yet they're not ranked. You know, explain that. I, I just don't understand. I don't know what t you got the Dunkel rating. So what, does, what, what does Dunkel say about it in the Daily Herald? Dunkel, uh, the good old Dick Dunkel is is a little low on those teams too, just because of their size. The the way the Dunkel ratings go, if you look at the college Dunkel ratings, it's like an Augustana is always going to have a lot less than the University of Wisconsin. I'd I'd be willing to say Augustana <laughs> could give Wisconsin a, a game these days, but the way it's the size of the school has a lot to do with the Dunkel ratings, which are all which he, he likes to call as, as kind of like the stock market index of, of local high school and college football. And uh, well, the stock market's fluctuating. <laughs> Thankfully, Dunkel's a lot more stable than, than anything that we've seen in the stock market lately. Now, odds are, let's say both Naperville's get in, when would they play each other in the playoffs from past history? Like the second game, probably, since you don't mm -hmm. match up the same conference the first time out? Generally, uh, it Conference teams would uh, run into each other the second time, right. the second round. But but who knows with the way the playoff pairings are? You know, they could uh, find themselves going to East St. Louis for the first game, or uh, <laughs> Moline, or who, who knows how they. You know, they have gotten better about that, not traveling them as far. Last year, the two Wheatons met in the 5A quarterfinals, so that would have been third round. So it, it, it just depends. It, it usually isn't that first week, which is a Wednesday, Friday, yeah. a Wednesday, they Saturday. They try to avoid right. the Wednesday opener. It's and they try to avoid the, the Saturday as well. So it, it usually, either that Saturday, the first Saturday, or the week after the quarterfinal. So now why is it that East St. Louis always hosts a, a semifinal? Do they always just, that, it's it's, it's that, part, of, <laughs> that part of the bracketing, and then since they haven't hosted until that point, they have to get a home game? A lot has to do with the fact that they try to not start them at home because they're the furthest usually that makes the playoffs. They're, they're the largest school downstate, so it's usually somebody from up in this area that has to go down there. So they usually try to make East St. Louis play on the road that first game. Yeah, they tend to win one or two road games, and then uh, someone has to go there. <laughs> and last year it was Naperville North, and I don't know, you know, that, that that's pretty imposing to go out there and play on that field that they play at all year long when there's not a blade of grass on it, and it's just... <laughs> You know, diamond drive baseball. It's, it's uh, intense. It's they they like their football down in East St. Louis, and it's intense. And I covered the state championship game last year when they lost to Mount Carmel, and that was their second year in a row having lost in the state finals. And their coach was not pleased. That that <laughs> that's a losing season for them is to lose in the state finals. Well, so as much as Naperville North is the Oakland A's, you can say East St. Louis is too. But they're not going to want to come back. And, and it's funny and how East again. St. Louis works because uh, you know people say, well, there's no recruiting in high school. That's baloney because you look down there and uh, East St. Louis senior. They get all the football players. East St. Louis Lincoln gets all the basketball players. And tell me it's, no it's a fluke. Reading. It's a fluke. Yeah. yeah. It's just a coincidence. Maybe Come on, Jeff. So, yeah. You know better block, than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to take a break right now and come back. We've got uh, the AD of Naperville North coming up, Neil McCauley, so stick around. Crossing the street can seem like one of the simplest things to do. What it can be is one of the most dangerous. 
I'm Officer Greg Wakus of the Naperville Police Department. In the past three years, nearly 150 pedestrians and bicyclists have been injured in accidents while crossing the street because they ignored a few simple rules. Always cross at the corner and use a crosswalk if there is one marked. Never cross in the middle of a block. Jaywalking can cause an accident that will hurt you more than it will a car weighing as much as one ton. Darting out from between parked cars makes you difficult for a driver to see. Parents use extra care when crossing a street with a stroller. Because children are often in a hurry, hold their hand firmly when crossing the street with toddlers. Remember, I always look both ways first before crossing the street. Hi, hey, welcome back to Sports Check, and our guest now is Neil McCauley, Athletic Director of Naperville North. Neil, thanks for being here, and congratulations on another uh, state title trophy for the high school, thanks to the boys' golf team. Thank you. Uh, we were very pleased with the performance that our kids made this weekend. It came as a little bit of a surprise, actually. We thought we had a shot at being in the top three, um, and we thought St. Charles was going to be the one that we are going to have to worry about, but... Uh, the kids really came through. They played extremely well. All of them did, you know, and uh, that's what it takes. You got to put them, put the scores together back to back, and that's what we're able to do. What does the state title mean to the school? This is your second one, the girls' soccer earlier. It's the first boys' title we've ever had. We had a girls' soccer uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and the whole ex school is excited. Uh, to have a state champion, you know, is a pretty good accomplishment at any sport, right. and uh, to get our second one already, as young as we are. Uh, everybody's pretty proud of them. And there's talk of you guys being the school of the 90s, the <laughs> school in the state that uh, that could dominate high school sports. Well, I don't know about that. We're we're on a bubble right now. Things are going pretty well for us. I don't know how long that bubble's going to last, but I think most of it comes from the dedication of the kids we've got there and the dedication of the coaching staff. We're extremely proud of all of them. They've all worked very hard. You had to replace your baseball coach who have been there for a long, long time, and you brought in um, a coach from Joliet Catholic to take his place on the baseball diamond, Carl Hunkler, but also in the football staff because there's also some doubling up, obviously. Right. Carl is working with our defensive backs, which is the same place Paul did, and he's doing an outstanding job. Now, we went out to hire a baseball coach first, and that was our first priority. And uh, when we started looking around, we found Carl, and he was able to fit into the football program also. So that was a, a real plus for us in that job. Of course, homecoming just this past weekend for the football team. It's got to be nice now, second homecoming actually at the school. It, which is. <laughs> it is. It's nice to walk out the back door and have your <laughs> field right there and not have to get on a bus to go to home. <laughs> you guys have had a good fall season. Besides the boys' golf, we were talking about the girls' golf ended up placing in state. Sixth they place. were sixth in the state. And the soccer is, boys' soccer is playing for a conference championship tomorrow night, Tuesday night. And that will be at home against uh, Wheaton Central, who we've beaten before, but also Naperville Central have beaten them also. So right. We're kind of down the same position we were in last year, only the roles a little bit reversed, because Wheaton Central did come through and win the, uh, the conference tournament, but didn't have enough to win the, the, outs, the conference outright. So From last year, and the same thing will happen right. this year. And mm -hmm. So far, you've so clinched the tie. We're guaranteed in a tie at this point. Is this one of those years where you get, some years you just get a class of athletes that, that excel in every season and uh, kind of like students, I mean, have you seen that happen through your years? Uh, you just get a certain class and you have a great athletic year? We have had 
three or four classes back to back that have been that way. And that's what I'm referring to when I say I don't know how long that bubble's going to last, you know. We're riding the crest of a very good group of young men and women that, that are there. They're dedicated, willing to work hard to make the program successful, and I think we've just been fortunate. You also have a very strong coaching staff, and that's something I've talked to you about, the way you've built that coaching staff. Well, um, they, they are. You, you're right. looking for a certain people. type of person, aren't you, when you're, right. you're out we're, looking for a coach? We're trying to find somebody that fits into the program, that has a concern about athletes being successful, whether they're in their program or someone else's. Uh, we also have to have the type of coach who understands that in order for our athletic program to be successful, athletes have to be shared. We have very few one-sport athletes. You can look on our football team that's being successful this fall. An awful and lot of the number, the number of athletes, two- and three-sport athletes right. that are on there. So we, we have to do that. And for a big school, that's not necessarily the rule now. That's almost the exception as far as, you know, athletes that don't specialize. I think we're coming back to that a little bit. I think a few years ago specialization was a bigger thing. Um, they felt that in order to get a college scholarship they had to specialize it by the end of their sophomore year. Now I don't think that's true. I, I don't think that feeling's there in many schools. Some of the sports specialization tends to be more popular. Uh, a gymnast, for example, there's not a lot of movement back and forth. Swimmers are usually in year-round programs, and there's not a lot of movement back and forth. There might be some, but not the the common the common movement. Uh, football, basketball, wrestling, baseball, track, they're finding that they can do as many as they want. I think one of the other things we try to emphasize is that for most of these kids, this is going to be the end of their athletic career anyway. So why limit yourself to one or two? Play as much as you can, have as much fun as you it's can. It's a great attitude. <laughs> How about a limiting number of sports? Something that's come up in the past year is boys volleyball. Is that something Naperville North is looking into come springtime? We had uh, an, our inter intramural program last year, and the kids, the juniors and seniors, had to form their own teams, and we thought we'd have three or four. We ended up having 30 teams in eight of teams. We're counting cards. What else did you do? Kiss Susanna. Did you enjoy kissing a woman? I don't know. I don't know how near it will be. We want to take care of the ones we've got right now first. If, if we can afford to expand without hurting the present sports we've got, then we'll look at it that way. Are there any other new girl sports on the horizon? Or is Not that right a pretty now. Set we, field? Haven't, we haven't seen anything start to appear at this point. Uh, we'll just <laughs> kind of keep an eye on it and see what happens. <laughs> you mentioned swimming a little while ago. That must have been nice a couple of years ago. You had some Olympic swimmers, right? Yes. Uh, the Minervini brothers from the transferred in from Italy. Um, Gianni was swam in the Olympics for Italy, and he was also NCAA champion when he was. I can't remember. He's either Southern Cal or UCLA that he swam for. Just recently, a week or two or three ago, he won some uh, European meet. I heard. Was well, that right? I didn't. So know he's still at it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the thing about your school. You get a lot of move-ins. Of course, you get a lot of move-outs. I mean, it's just that kind of, you know, town right now, I guess. That's true. I think when we have the, the corporate setup that we have here, that, that uh, people are moved in and trained, and then they're advanced and they move out. Uh, I'm wondering if this uh, golf championship would be the first of many, because with the golf boom in this area, uh, Tamarack and uh, White Eagle, they're building Stonebridge, all these golf courses. And Contigny just up the road. Contigny, you're going to have all these golfers in the area, you know, Naperville Central, Naperville North, Wabonsi. I mean, do, do you think that might be something? This might I, be a I sure hope you're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The girls Again, you've got to have that same group of kids coming through at the same time mm -hmm. uh, that have the commitment that are willing to play all summer long because uh, the high school season is actually the – the wind-up of what they've done in the spring and the summer. If they've played and got their scores down where it belongs, then you're going to carry that over into the fall season. Is there a shorter high school season than the high school golf season? Or any sports? I don't think so. <laughs> I think the school starts, right. and next thing you know, it's a state tournament. You're like, what's going on? Who won? We talked a couple weeks ago to Dick Kerner of Wabansi Valley, the, you know, the shake-up of the little seven conference down the line. Oswego and Wabansi are basically no longer going to be welcome in that conference. And the talk about, well, the DuPage Valley is just down the road. I mean, do you see that eventually happening somehow? I don't know. We've talked a little bit about expanding the DuPage Valley. Everybody's pretty happy with having eight teams. Your scheduling works out a lot easier. And nobody is interested in leaving. Uh, 
you may think with some of the scores that have been occurring that that might be happening, but it's really not. There are, the conference is a very strong conference athletically, but also academically. And I think it's a benefit to all the schools to get together academically. And, and we have Scholastic Bowl and science projects and math contests and everything else. So there's a lot more in our conference just besides athletics. And also a lot of the scores you see are the football and the basketball scores because that's, that's right. what people want to read about. You don't, you don't hear about the cross country as often. You don't hear about the golf that, that some of the smaller schools can compete in and you know, Tennessee individual sports like that too. So it's not like the two Naperville's are just completely dominating. Right. They're, they're obviously very successful and, and doing well as, as a state title would show. But it, I, I don't see it as, as you, your, your school in Naperville Central is dominating the conference. No, we certainly don't. Uh, the other thing along with those lines, it, eight is such an easy number to work with. Uh, when you get to nine or if you get to ten, then that means you have no non-conference football games. Or if you keep non-conference ones, then you can't come up with a conference champion because you don't play everybody like the Big Ten does. Uh, I would prefer to keep it at 18. That's my personal preference. So a lot of rumors saying, oh, gee, West Chicago would go to the Little Seven and so on. I mean, like they haven't expressed any desire to leave the conference even. No, they haven't. Do, do you foresee anything like the, this entire area? There's so much growth out here. Uh, say like Little Seven, Upstate 8, DuPage Valley. Do you see uh, this area realigning in all the conferences? Uh, There's a possibility that that could happen. I really don't see it, though, because if we look to the south and see what the SICA conference has done, that's a school of 32 teams, or a conference of 32 teams. I don't want to get to that either, <laughs> where they've got five different divisions. Uh, I'm very comfortable with the eight schools we have in our conference. I think we have a lot going on. And good afternoon and once again welcome to Sports Check. I'm Mark Vasco from WKKD. Along for the ride, Jeff Long from the Beacon News. We've got uh, a couple of our cohorts out acting like reporters, so we'll excuse them <laughs> for the day. But a little bit later on, we'll be joined by Gary Goforth, head football coach and assistant AD at Bennett Academy. So for the next half hour or so, talk about some high school sports. And Jeff, we saw a couple of very good football games this past weekend, and you saw a game for first place in the Little Seven Conference. Right. Uh, well, both days I got to see what high school football is all about. I saw Morris Oswego on Friday night. And Saturday was Marmion and Driscoll. Both were for first place in their respective conferences, and uh, both turned out to be what they were billed up to be. Although Marmion and Driscoll, I don't think uh, Marmion won that 33 to seven. I don't think people expected the score to be that one-sided. I just went to show that uh, Marmion indeed is for real. Well, in two battles for first place, as we said, that were basically lopsided scores. And I, and like I say, I don't know if too many people expected us we go to beat Morris, but. I mean, Morris proved that they're going to be a team to be dealt with in the playoffs. Well, a lot of people are forecasting Morris to win the state championship class 4A. They're that good, and uh, I, that, that was the first time I'd seen them this year. And the, the, the size they have, they're like a, a college team almost, and they have great speed to go with it. They're just a, a very good team. They have great tradition, and uh, this might be one of their best teams in years. Um, the, the thing about it is, though, Oswego had three touchdowns called back in that game, and who knows? Uh, th th that could have made a big difference. Uh, obviously, it would have given him what 21 points. So, but as uh, Coach Carl Hunk has said down at Oswego, he doesn't play the if game. <laughs> the final score was 24 to nothing, and that's that's all that mattered. But it, like you say, it's still not a bad reflection on Oswego, though. I mean, let's face it; they're still a very good football team that's going to contend in, when they get in the playoffs. Oh yeah, they're they're going to make their fourth consecutive trip to the playoffs, and uh, I don't think anybody really expected them to beat uh, or beat Morris, like you said. Uh, uh, they gave it their best, and Morris is just too good. Uh, it, one of the, the Geneva coach, Larry Davis, told me early in the year that you could assemble an all-star team from Little Seven and still not beat Morris. That's how good Morris is. Now, Oswego is going to be 5A or 4A? Uh, they'll be 5A. And, I mean, if they I got believe. the points to get in, oh, let's say... Maybe. It's, it's tough to tell. I think the enrollment there is uh, about 1,300. Does that sound about right? So they may have to wait and find out what yeah. class they're going to play yeah, in? They've been f uh, 4A the last few years. I'd have to think they'll stay 4A. I didn't bring the enrollment breakdowns with me from last year, but uh, they would probably stay right at the top of 4A. If not, they'd be at the bottom of 5A. But they've got the points to get in. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oswego, I, I did this up this morning. Even if they lose to Plainfield this weekend, uh, they'd have 43 points, which is 
37 above what you need to get in. 36 has been the cutoff the last few years. Uh, 35 was a couple years ago just because of the strike in the public league and that, but uh, 36 has been the cutoff, and so Oswego is in win, win or lose this weekend. Okay, now the game I was at Friday night was a great game, the DuPage Valley Conference, and that was uh, the Wheaton North team beating Naperville Central in a great contest. It was a great defensive battle because it was 3 nothing all the way through the game until the fourth quarter. Naperville Central wasn't really able to establish any offense as far as any sustained drives were concerned, but they break one big, long 71-yard touchdown run by Omar Weathersby. After training the whole game, they come back and are leading 6-3. to three. They didn't get the extra point, which we thought might be important. It turned out that it really didn't matter that much because then, just a couple minutes to go, Wheaton North turns around, makes their only real sustained drive of the football game. They get in the end zone, and they come away with a win, and that basically destroys Naperville Central's conference hopes, but of course they'll still be in the playoffs because they've got plenty of points, don't they? Right. As we were talking earlier, uh, both those teams, uh, Wheaton North and Naperville Central, are probably the two best defensive teams in the, in the real tough DuPage Valley Conference. Uh, both are going to make the playoffs. And uh, I believe they've both given up roughly 50 points in eight games, which is outstanding when you consider the, the type of competition they played. Now, Naperville Central hasn't seen Naperville North yet. Uh, they'll see him this week. And uh, Wheaton North, I remember, gave up 28 points to Naperville, nearly half of what they get, they've given up in the other seven games. So uh, anyways, as far as Naperville Central goes, they're the same boat as Oswego. They'll, they'll have uh, 43 points. Uh, Saying that they lose to Naperville this week, they'll have 43 points. So they, they're a shoe, and they'll be a, th those two teams are two of the four teams out of DuPage Valley that'll make the playoffs. We've got the DuPage Valley standings, I know, and we'll have those in just a second. As with these games we were just talking about, that means that Naperville North, after they pounded Glenbard East real, uh, real convincingly, they'll uh, they'll come in as the conference champions. It appears, and then after that, you've got uh, you know the, the Wheatons which, as we said, we'll get in the playoffs, and both Wheatons will play each other on Friday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I, I believe both the Wheatons are 5A and both the Naperville's are 6A. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's... You're right. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the, you know, it's good that this last weekend you see all, all the nice rivalries are being played. You know, the Naperville's uh, in Aurora, we got East and West playing, uh, and then, then you have the Wheatons. So regardless of the records, those, those games are always... Always good matchups. They're great rivalries and, and they're fun for everybody that's involved. And they used to be on Thanksgiving Day. Remember when there actually used to be football on Thanksgiving Day? Not right. anymore. No, it's basketball. They're all playing there. basketball <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day. Little Seven Conference. We talked about Morris beating Oswego, so that means that uh, they're in first place at this point. Wabansi well, Valley, though, uh, they got a big win for them, which means even if Morris beats them on Friday night, they should get in the playoffs. How is their points? Well, Bonsi Valley is, is in the playoffs. Uh, even if Morris beats them on Friday, which they probably will, uh, Bonsi will finish up with 37 points. Uh, there are two non-conference opponents, which were East Aurora and Ottawa. East Aurora has won one game, and Ottawa has won three. So if they stay as they are, they're going to pick up, what, four, four wins in the conference, regardless on Friday night, uh, you know, with all the interconference games. So saying that East Aurora and Ottawa don't win this weekend, uh, well, Bonsi would still have 37 points, which should get them in. So Wabansi will get in, and last week there would have, could have been five teams in Little Seven that could have gotten in the playoffs. That's down now to, theoretically, four teams, but uh, we'll see what Plainfield, they have to come up with a win their last game of the year in order for that to happen. Uh, the Upstate 8 Conference this past weekend, the Cowboys suffered their first loss of the year, but uh, they're still a shoe, and obviously with their seven wins, they're going to get into the playoffs. Streamwood, they kept their playoff hopes alive as they got themselves a win this past weekend, so uh, they, even with a couple of four losses, are such a good bo football team, that looks like they're going to get in. Yeah, they're still alive. I talked to one of the uh, sports writers up at the Elgin paper this morning and asked him about Streamwood's chances, and he said that, the, obviously they have to win this weekend, but one of the things they're counting on, they need help from a couple other teams who they played earlier in the year uh, to make you know qualify by points. But that means only two teams from the state eight that are going to get in the first two teams, because even though all the rest of those ball clubs, you know, three losses in conference, they all have non-conference losses, and that means that only two teams from the Upstate Eight will get in. The Suburban Catholic Conference, we just talked about, you know, that Marmion game. Marmion defeated to Southern Plate, and Marmion just demolished him, and no one thought that was going to happen by that wide a score. Oh, the, they just dominated every, every facet of the game. It was really surprising to see that, because Driscoll had come in there highly touted. They had multiple off uh, given up I don't know the exact number, but the, I think they'd only allowed double digits once all year. And uh, just to see what Marmion did to them, they just dismantled 
they, they intercepted four passes and you know really took it to them. Alan Bruckner had what three touchdowns, 145 three, yards on the three ground. Three touchdowns, yeah. Yeah, that was a season high for him. Uh, it was only 10 yards short of his uh, career high, which he hopes to get next week against St. Francis because that's the team he has his previous career high against. So the only the top two teams in that conference will also be the only playoff teams from the suburban Catholic independent. There, the Bennett Academy Red Wings had a shot at the uh, the playoff berth, but were knocked off by a very good Providence team this past weekend. So we're going to go on the the Providence, which we'll talk to Gary Goforth about in just a little while. But that's a look at the standings anyway around the area. Now, any other teams that you might see from this area on the fence, let's say Interstate 8, Yorkville, they may have three losses. What's their situation? Well, you know, the, the Vikings won't defeat us this week. Now, they lose that game. Uh, they are really on the bubble because they'll need to count on some other teams. They're two non-conference opponents, Caneland and uh, Roar Central Catholic. Uh, if both of those teams win on Friday, that'll give Yorkville 37 points. So the, they control their own destiny in terms of that they, if they beat Cole City, they're automatically in. But if they beat Cole City, they're, they're going to be sitting around nervously on Saturday night. And beating undefeated Cole City is not going to be an easy task necessarily. No, no not at all. And, and it's at Cole City. So it'll be, uh, the, the Yorkville has its work cut out. Uh, it's been, if you want to call six and three on year for York, they catch up with seven wins, but a regular season. So and I guess it is a, a down year for them. I suppose. Uh, just a couple <laughs> other things to mention uh, as far as that is concerned. Um, Naperville North, as we said, you know, took on a team that was winless in the conference Friday night. That's the game that uh, I was out covering for WKD, and uh, we were giving updates on that game with Greg Hansen out there while I was at Wheaton North. And every time Greg Hansen would come out with an update, it was Sean Drendle scoring another touchdown. I think he had four touchdowns in that football game, and he only played the first half. So I mean, there was no question that they were going to let down against Glen East, waiting for Naperville. A game that comes up on Friday. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think Naperville North could have probably doubled the score last week if they wanted to, but you know, Coach McEwen has more class than to do something like that. And I think he wanted to rest some of his guys. They're they're going to the playoffs. Uh, then when they don't mean that much to, from a scenario, you know, they, they look undefeated. You got to do not to not to injure any of because they could have a lot of games left. Uh, you know, if they go as far as they'd like. Well, you know, there's no doubt that when they were seven and zero, they said seven and zero and seven to go. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that. Uh, they may go quite a ways if they don't meet up again with East St. Louis in the playoffs. And I know they've been sort of, you know, talking with the IHSA. Why don't you send somebody else out that way again this year? Mm -hmm. And they were talking about, I think, Evanston they mentioned, and a few other teams that they might now shuffle things up so the same two teams don't match up again. Yeah, I mean, they might, the IHSA might, might pull us and send Evanston down there. Or they could bring East St. Louis up here. I'm not sure East St. Louis doesn't come up early. Freeze uh, wide, but I... I'm not sure East St. Louis doesn't travel. I think it has to do with the bracketing, the way they start it, mm -hmm. and then once they get that going, you, that, that team has played on the road, the bracketing, which they get a home game, mm -hmm. and then they, because they're the team that continues to win, they've got to get them their home games where they end up. I don't know why, but I hope they shuffle it up so that doesn't necessarily happen one more time. Well, we're going to take a break for a while, and we've got uh, Gary Goforth of Bennett Academy, so stick around. <laughs> 